It's six weeks until the election, so let's get stuck in. The Stormont Executive might not come back, or if it does, which political party will deliver for you? And what matters to you? Is it the protocol? Is it orange or green? It's time to start talking about the right people. Who are they to run this country and why? Also tonight, Mary Lou McDonald fires a warning to unionists who may not share power with Sinn Féin. They will only accept power sharing if it conforms to their blueprint of unionist dominance and the vetoing of progress. But those days are over and they're not coming back. And the comedy genius behind the smash hit show, Father Ted, says he's been cancelled for his views on trans issues. Yeah, yeah. You know, they took everything from me, you know. Like what? What do you mean? They took my, they took my, my family, you know. We are live on BBC One. That means we want you to be part of the show. There's a number coming on your screen, 03030 80 55 55. And as always, it's the public, it's you, it's the punters all over Northern Ireland who make Nolan Live, every Nolan show we do, what it is. In six weeks' time, we go to the polls and it is not clear if there's even going to be an executive after the, the election. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, and look, there's Doug Beatty. They won't even confirm whether they would work with the Sinn Féin First Minister. So, what should be driving you? What should be the driving force for your vote in May? Should it be the protocol? Does that mean more to you than health waiting lists, for example, than our economy? The cost of living crisis, it's really hurting people. So now, as much as ever before, we need leaders who deliver for the most vulnerable in our society because Let's think about this. Catholics and Protestants, they're as cold as each other when they can't afford heating. So there's nobody in this place can turn orange and green an issue around that. We're starting off Nolan Live tonight with John. For him, he's lost all faith in politicians. The question is, will any party make his life better? I've just gone in, what he called, basically, to lift what he called me, SA. And yeah. then what he called, turn around, uh, leave, I have to leave so much of it in the bank to pay bills. And then I've got a wee bit to myself. I mean, by the time I pay this, that, and the other out of it, daily things that I have to do, you know, I'm down to near none. Put 20 on that one. 20 electric. Aye. And you better put that one up, Billy, to the full 49. You want 49 on that? Aye. I'll not, I'll not, I'll not go as far as usual. No. Price of gas. Shocking, John. That just cost me £50 for gas. What do you call £20 for electric? And as you can see, I buy value bacon. As you see me outside the post office, I turn around and say to you, like, I put a hundred pound into my pocket. Well, I've just got Billy. Seventy odd of it. There now. So that's, like, I'm, I'm basically there for 30 quid out of that a hundred pound already. Gas is rising by 39 percent. Things is, they don't they don't have to sit and study it and make sure what you're putting in your your meters are covering you. What he called and trying to make sure that you're not going to run. But the, the way that this is going, what he called, I'm going to run out of my supply that I had and I had it really really built up. And once I run out of it, what he called, the, the whole thing packs in. And there's an engineer needed to come out. What he called it. I don't know where it's coming from, I don't. That is what this election coming up is going to partly be about if the Nolan Show has anything to do with it. Real people in this country and testing me 
and, and journalism throughout this country, testing each political party, not about all the kink that sometimes we talk about, but about people like him and testing every leader in this country and every politician in this country, what's your policy? How are you going to deliver? What's your thinking? What are your promises? So let this election kick off right now. I can't tell you how angry I think quite a few of you. Well, I'll talk about myself. Like I'm, I'm angry on that man's behalf. That he just feels that he's no trust in politics. He's no trust in, 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 in any sense of optimism. And what do we then do in this country? We continue to fight about arguments that we've had for what? How many years? Decades. And you can pick up the phone tonight. 030 30 80 55 55. Paul Doherty from the SDLP. Uh, is here with us this evening. Owen Tennyson is here from the Alliance Party this evening. Well, Owen, let me start with you. What's it like when you see that? Can you promise that man delivery without the same old chat that we get in this country year in, year out? Stephen, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And I have to say, I've spoken to many people, unfortunately, like John, who are in this situation, who are sat at home tonight, facing, uh, worrying about whether they're going to be able to heat their homes or feed their kids tomorrow. And I have to say, if we can't agree as politicians and as political parties, that the cost of living crisis and people like John are our number one priority, then I have to ask ourselves, what are we doing here at all? But what can Stormont do about this? There are You've no tax raising power. You can barely sit down with each other and agree anything anymore without huge squabbles. So what can you do for that man? Well, absolutely. I mean, I think Stormont over the past number of weeks has failed. We don't have a functioning executive, and I think that is, an, that is utterly shameful. We are failing people like John. This, the executive is failing people like John. And I think that is an utter and absolute disgrace. There are things within the executive's power that we could do. We know we have £300 million sitting in the coffers waiting to be allocated that could support people through a voucher scheme. The spring statement was made today. There will be additional Barnet consequences arising from that. That will add to Stormont's coffers in terms of the funding that's available. So the money is there. It's not a question of there being no funding or us needing tax yeah, The voucher powers. scheme's only going to be a stick and plaster. There's of course no it is, addressing Stephen. of the of root course problems it is, here, the inequality in this country. Of course it is, Stephen, and that's, but that's a first step reaching those people in crisis, those people who are in immediate fuel and food poverty. In the longer term, we need to look at, for example, the Fiscal Commission's report, which said that income tax raising powers could be devolved to Northern Ireland and we could look at a more progressive system, like Scotland, for example. But the, so you the think ultimate Northern premise... Ireland's at a place where it should trust our, our politicians with tax raising powers now? This is the key, Stephen. This election coming up on the 5th of May is not about how our politics functions for the next five years. It's about if our politics functions. And if people go out and they vote for people who share their concerns, who share their frustration, and who are committed to delivery and delivering functioning government and delivering on health waiting lists, well, cost of living and well, everything well, else, then we can achieve. Yep. Do you think the executive's coming back? I'm concerned, Stephen, I'll be honest, um, that we may be looking into another period of stalemate but it is not inevitable. If people vote for parties who are willing to work together, an alliance have said for our part, whether we qualify for first minister or deputy first minister, hypothetically in any of those situations, regardless of who our partner would be, we would go into government because we accept though the system is imperfect and we'd like to see reform, we are in a mandatory system and the two largest, the, the largest party and the largest party in the next largest designation have a responsibility to ensure that we have government that let's, can deliver for people. Let's uh, go to the phone straight away. Sinead and Derry, you're going to be our first call tonight. Paul, come to you in a second. Hello, Sinead. Hi, Stephen. How are you? I'm doing all right, thank you. Go ahead. Good. Hi. Um, I am from a group called Dairy Against Fuel Poverty um, and I've just been listening to what's been said there and I, I, to be honest, it, it just makes me really, really angry when I listen to stories like John, which I do every day. My own story is um, not as dire as John's, but quite similar. Um, what, 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 why would people turn out to vote? Why would people turn out to vote when they can't even turn on their heat because they're terrified um, of, of the bill well, or they're terrified <laughs> that they won't have the money for the food? Well, because surely to goodness you will be able to find whatever the political party is in this country that will be able to give you a leg up, that will be able to support you, that will inspire you, or a political leader... 
They haven't done it, Stephen. They've had since October to deal with this crisis and every step of the way, they didn't do it. Like, even the government departments, if I budgeted as badly as our government departments did, I'd be on the streets right now. You know, that's what the executive has delivered and it's delivered an absolute failure for the people who are on the bottom rung here. And, and you are rightly so covered the story so, so well and you're hearing the stories like John's. Um, the stress, the grief, the trauma, but not being able to buy the basic things that human beings need. Like, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. The right to love and dignity. You know, I always hold that very, very high up. The right to be able to love and dignity and participate fully in society. That man has not been able to do that. It's the government. But does he matter? The lack of action. But does he matter? Does he, he actually... Well, does he, he matter? Really matter to me does he matter? To do, does he matter to any political party in this country to the extent that they will do something about it? Every one no. of them will say, "They look." And, and what I'm going to do ahead of this election, just so we're clear, I'm going to try to give every political party that wants to come on any show I do a platform to sell you their vision. Now we have a situation at the moment. We'll just say this: get it out of the road. So. Sinn Féin's still huffing over the Bobby Story uh, coverage. What's that? Two and a half years ago, they're huffing. They weren't huffing when I was doing RHI. And now we've got the DUP. They're huffing with the Nolan Show because we happened to tell a story about Jeffrey Donaldson that was true. And now they're not talking to us. And meanwhile, they've got chances to talk to you, the electorate, right up to this election. And there's no problem if they want to do so. Paul, can you sell the SDLP's vision for how you can help people in this country who feel completely estranged from politics? It's simple, Stephen. We need to put people first. That's the priority. People well, are the priority. It's that's not, it's, not, it's not when you... Again, my line of work, I work in the community of West Belfast, and, again, enough of people being told that this is as good as it gets. People deserve better. I work in a food bank in West Belfast. They run a food bank in West Belfast, and we've seen this week 400 people have to avail of support to put food on their table, to heat their homes. It's absolutely shocking. Throughout the winter months, we were experiencing elderly residents sitting in uh, coffee shops and supermarkets just to keep warm. I went into the food bank this morning at 9.30 this morning. I dropped the kids off at school and I got a phone call from a lady and she was tearful and crying down the phone. And she just kept saying the same words. I've let them down. I've let them down. She wasn't able to give a breakfast to her children before they went to school yeah, this morning. That, that's that's the, that's where we're at. That, yeah, that's where we're, we're at. That's at. a failure. But here's of where we're also here. at. Failure politics. Your party's in the executive. So where's been the policy from your party? Again, what we, where's what, been the effectiveness from your party? But again, again, the problem's not the assembly. It's the politicians who are more interested in putting their party interests first rather than people first. Again, we have seen the positives. We have seen a lot of work and a lot of progress very recently. And what we can achieve, look what we can achieve when we come together and sit around a where's table the and work together. What is but it? Again, we have seen good things. We've seen my colleagues, uh, Colin McGrath, get laws changed to introduce CPR training in schools. Pat Catney tomorrow uh, will be changing the law to provide period products uh, free in public places. So we can not see where there can be positives when people sit around a table. And it's not just a tagline. We do need to put people first. Our politics here Can is too divisive. Can you talk to me about any strategy that your party has created while it's been Absolutely. What, 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 what we're pushing for, for, we're pushing for the, the, very, the very story that I'm telling you, Stephen, the thing that's happening on the ground in my community where people are struggling. We need to look at things. For example, we're pushing the Education Minister about reactivating the free school meal payment scheme uh, to ensure that no child goes hungry. We need to look at that. We need to look at those sort of things that are going to be... We need to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Been in a government. Well, again, for me, <laughs> I, I've for, for me as someone coming here, I, I've I've had enough of seeing uh, failure in my community, and that's why I'm stepping up. That's my motivation. My motivation is people. So why are you joining a party that's been in a government that's been part of that failure? In no, your own words? no, no. Again, my party, and again, my party's been very focal and I've been pushing this week. We have proposed ways to tackle this crisis. Your right party here wanted to see the right 300 now. million. Your no. party wanted to give the 300 million to everybody in Northern Ireland, didn't it? Spread it out among everybody, but again, but not just the vulnerable. Not that is, but Stephen, again, for someone like myself working in a, in a food bank and running a food bank, I'm seeing the working families are struggling here as well. You must hear from working families. People are struggling. I've had nurses come in and not been able to feed the children. Do you children. think I need yes. part of that 300 million? No, but again, we, we need to look it away. But again, we, we, need, we need to support people. There's working people there. There's people from all sorts of backgrounds who are struggling as a result of the crisis we find ourselves in. Dermot. Hello, Dermot. Hiya, Stephen. Go ahead, Dermot. Uh, 
there's there seems to be a lot of people disappointed with the executive, and it's hard to disagree with them. You know, I'm not going to, as a young person, I'm a member of youth parliament, and I hear from young people all the time, you know, we're all applying for university, we're all looking at possibly going over the water, I've got friends looking at America, you know, some people are talking about doing, you know, study abroad, and people are talking about not coming back, and you can see why, like, you know, politics over here, we've just lost an executive with the possibility of losing it in three hundred million pounds where, you know, there's constant political instability. The brain drain is ripping young people out of here and people aren't coming back. You can see why people have lost faith in politics. So you is this is this election, vote. do you think, is this election gonna be different than all that's gone before? It has to Should be. Should it be? Maybe not. It has to be. Because what do we do? Like a lot of people feel like maybe direct rule is the next move, but direct rule isn't going to be any better. I don't want to hand power to the Tory party. Even if Sinn Féin took their seats in the store, or in Westminster, we don't need control 2% of the agenda we, because me, we've only got 18 MPs. Let me, let me bring in Sam McBride from the Belfast Telegraph, Alison Morris from the Belfast Telegraph. Uh, hello to you, Sam. Let's start with you. Good evening. Hello, Sam. You're the Northern Ireland for the, for the Telegraph. Is this election, or even should it be, about the wider issues, education, health? Should it be about the protocol? Should it be about orange and green? What's it going to be? Well, it's not my position as a journalist to tell any voter what they should base their vote on. It's for, it's for me to give them information. It's for them to make those decisions. Historically in Northern Ireland, we know that elections have overwhelmingly for um, the vast majority of the public been about orange and green. That, that, that is proven in how they vote. Um, is that going to be the case forever? Well, that's, that's entirely up to the public. Um, but I think that we, we have to be realistic about what Stormont can and can't do here. It can't change global fuel prices it can't stop the war in Ukraine. It can't stop all sorts of things which are very far beyond our control anywhere on these islands. But what it can do is use the powers which it has wisely. And we, we, we've spoken recently, um, Stephen, on your radio programme about Stormont not spending something in the region of £600 million over the next 20 years, um, which are set aside specifically to help people with heating costs. Now, that, that is unforgivable. Um, so I think we, we, are, we cannot blame Stormont for all of this crisis, but we absolutely can blame them for what they haven't done um, and for what they've tried to do and have pretty monumentally oh. screwed up. Alison, that man at the top of our show tonight, I neither know nor give a damn whether he's a Catholic or a Protestant, whether he hangs whatever colour a flag out on, on, on the 12th of July or any other day of the week. I don't care. I care about the fact that he thinks he's no future. Is that an election winner for political parties in this country if they care? Look, the fact is, this sort of plague on all their houses, sort of commentary, the fact, the fact that that £300 million has not been allocated is basically down to the fact that the DUP was through the First Minister. We know that, and we know that's the case. Now, when Geoffrey Donaldson did that, he couldn't have known there was going to be a war in Ukraine. He couldn't have known that we were going to be spiralling spiral fuel prices. But he does know that now. And he had an opportunity, albeit he could have temporarily put Paul Given back into the Assembly for a day or two to allow that money to be allocated, but he has decided that the protocol is the most important issue. Now, I read a column about this very thing, and someone commented on social media that they would rather eat grass than have the First Minister go back into the Assembly when the protocol was there. Now, I believe that a person who says would rather eat grass than that is someone who has never put a child to bed hungry, who has never sent a child out to school in the morning hungry, who has never sat in a freezing cold house, who doesn't have to concern themselves about this, those sort of things, when the only thing that they're concerned about is a protocol which they can't see in checks in the Irish E. I do think that there has been a failure, but I think that we should be very clear where the failure has been. And I do think that when people go to vote, we will see whether or not the protocol is the most important thing to unionism because they have a very clear choice for a change. They have parties which have now differentiated themselves within unionism to say the protocol is the main issue or it's not. So we will see. So we're being told that for unionists this is the most important issue, but in a very, very few short weeks we're going to find out if that's the truth or not. Well, with no first or deputy first minister, Stormont is back in crisis territory. Uh, how many crises could it possibly have? It took a lot of work to get Sinn Féin and the DUP back around the table after the RHI scandal. But when you look back on then and now, are things really any different up on the hill?
We have not heard the truth. Instead, we have heard anything but the truth. I have made a statement to this chamber and laid down the facts of this scheme. My opponents were so interested, they walked out. We in Sinn Féin will not tolerate the arrogance of Arlene Foster and the DUP. After a three-year absence, devolution is on its way back. The Sinn Féin or Corla has met today and has taken the decision to re-enter the power-sharing institutions. My attendance at the funeral, I'm confident I can stand over at the fact that um, I worked within the, the guidelines. A short time ago, I called my party chairman to inform him that I intend to step down. I'm putting my name forward for the leadership of the Democratic Unionist Party. Did you face a motion of no confidence? Are you still leader of the party? Are you going to be leader of the party tomorrow? I'm very humbled to have uh, received the unanimous endorsement of all of our party executive. They undertook to do this in December, they undertook to do it in January, they undertook to do it in February, and now we have a new GUP leadership who says they're not going to honour any of those commitments. Broken commitments undermine seriously the ability to do power sharing. The protocol is harming the economy of Northern Ireland, therefore it must go. There comes a moment when we have to take tough decisions, and such a moment has arrived. This is absolutely crazy. I think it is completely reprehensible. It's an absolute betrayal of ordinary people. We cannot stagger on in the months ahead without a functioning executive, and Sinn Féin will not facilitate this. Well, the fight for First Minister threatens to dominate this election. It's up to you whether it does or not. The Sinn Féin President Mary Lou Macdonald says it is completely unacceptable that the DUP refuse to say if they will go into an executive if Republicans stop the poll. Their entire approach to this election is driven by the belief that the office of First Minister is not open to Republicans. It's a belief that exposes the leadership of the DUP that they will only accept democracy if it's democracy on their terms, that they will only accept power sharing if it conforms to their blueprint of unionist dominance and the vetoing of progress. But those days are over and they're not coming back. So we still, six weeks before the election, we still have a situation where neither Sir Geoffrey Johnson or Doug Beatty will even tell you they will not be clear about their policy. It's, it's hidden from you insofar as they won't tell you whether if a nationalist becomes first minister, they will work in a government here in Northern Ireland. Come on, guys. Why are the electorate not entitled to know? Jim Wells, you're out of that party in a couple of days' time. Can you tell us why people aren't entitled to know? I think they should know, Stephen. I think before the election, the electorate should know absolutely for certain which parties would nominate first minister or deputy first minister. My personal view is the DUP should not uh, uh, nominate a deputy first minister, but the, the, that internal discussion has not reached a conclusion. Uh, but I hope that by the time May the 5th comes around, everyone will know for certain where we stand on that. So the public can go out and vote and your party might ignore them? No, what I'm saying, Stephen, we have a right as a party to decide whether to accept the position of First or Deputy First Minister or not. All I think we whether need to Whether you accept the decision of democracy. So let me we... just get this right. In this country, we have a situation where it may be the case where the biggest unionist party says if the result, the Democratic Unionist Party says, mm -hmm. if the result goes our way, we'll accept it. If it doesn't go our way, we won't be part of the system. And that's our right, Stephen, to vote, uh, to go into government with Sinn Féin or not. Uh, that, that's, a, a party has the right to do that. My view is that Sinn Féin will ruthlessly use the position of First Minister to further its all Ireland agenda. They've been agenda. in a joint office with Sinn Féin for years. Yes, what but you know what you I mean, lot, Stephen. What are you lot on about? You've Stephen, been you in know. a joint office, literally an office with the same power. You cannot sign off a letter without Sinn Féin. You cannot do it. And Stephen, if that's the situation, why is Sinn Féin making an all-out effort to become the First Minister? 
you know the huge symbolic uh, importance of this position. Uh, so, the world will see this as the leader of Northern Ireland. And do or, we want a leader of Northern Ireland who doesn't even support the constitutional position of Northern Ireland, in fact, can't even say the words Northern Ireland? Do we want or, that person as First Minister? Well, Stephen, I think the fundamental principle here is that it's not for us as politicians to dictate who gets what position. It's for the public to decide that democratically in an election. I would love for Alliance to hold the First Minister post after the next election. That's what I'll strive to achieve. But the reality is I have to accept the result of the election after May the 5th. And we can test, we can test elections between elections. And then once the election is over, we have to work together. And if we can't agree at this stage to accept the democratic outcome, of that election, I'm concerned about where we're headed. But if we get to the 6th and 7th of May and it becomes clear the parties have placed themselves at loggerheads and drawn red lines or un and un are unwilling to work together, then we need to sit down and look at a system of government that can actually work, uh, where parties who are willing to work together can work together and no one party, be it the DUP or Sinn Féin, so are capable of holding the rest of us to ransom. Sam McBride, could this be another so-called crocodile moment in Northern Ireland, where, where we, we, we saw what the impact that that had in Northern Ireland in the past. Here we actually have the possibility of unionism saying to every nationalist man, woman and child in this country, no matter what the democratic will of the people is, you will not prevail. You will not have a place at the top of government. I think this has the potential to be much worse than the crocodile moment under Arlene Foster's leadership. Um, this is something which I think is both wrong in principle and pretty crazy and self-defeating in terms of the uh, self-interest of the DUP and the Ulster Unionist Party for that matter. You simply cannot play by rules, play a game, play an election, play anything, partake in something and accept the outcome when it goes your way and reserve the right to walk away and take the ball with you if you don't win. It's petulant, it doesn't make sense, it's indefensible um, at home or abroad. And um, when, when Jim Wells says that if there was a Sinn Féin First Minister that would somehow turbocharge Sinn Féin's campaign for Irish unity, I don't think it would do anything of the sort, but I think that what would turbocharge Sinn Féin's campaign is to be able to say, look at these bigoted unionists. They won't even allow us to get the position that we have democratically been elected to. I mean, how would Sir Geoffrey Donaldson go to America or go to Europe or, for that matter, go to Newry and try to explain that? It's a, it's a crazy situation that they've wandered into. And why is Doug Beatty not differentiating himself? Why is he not fronting up either? I think that's the most surprising thing because it's not a matter for him. And I think that there are two very easy exits from this. The first is to move to joint first ministers to just say, look, that is what this is. Let's forget about these titles because they're fundamentally meaningless. I think the, the, the better um, and the more durable way to deal with this is, is, to, is to say that um, both big parties in Northern Ireland, the two biggest parties, get a chance to be first or deputy first minister. But if they don't want to take up that position, fine, let everybody else form an executive. That would have stopped Sinn Féin pulling down government three years ago. Um, it would have stopped the DUP pulling down government this time. I think that there are particular reasons why people are offered a chance to be in the Northern Ireland executive. But should they be able to prevent everybody else from governing? I think that's indefensible. Alison Morris, how much of the electorate do you think will be will have the principle of this needs to be fair and fair might be defined by the electorate as politicians telling them what they will do with their vote do you think the dup and also unionist party has the right strategy of withholding from the electorate whether they will be part of the government or not if Sinn Féin take that first minister post I think the, the problem is that the DUP managed to win votes in the past by using this issue. You know, if you don't vote for Arlene, you get Martin. But the fact was, we're going back a long time when, you know, probably the, the sort of legacy of the Troubles was much fresher in people's mind. And also, Martin McGuinness was a very divisive character. They don't have the, the same leeway to try and do the same thing with Michelle O'Neill. And therefore, I think that as time has gone on, people's interest in who is first or deputy first minister, when the, the public here is smart enough to know that's a joint post, um, you know, one can't you know send a letter without the approval of the other. They're less and less interested and it becomes less of a vote winner. And I don't think that unionism is maybe caught up, caught up with, with that sentiment. 
than it does, as Sam say. It's things, you know, if I'm not the biggest child in the playground, well, then I'm not playing, you know, and I, I think that that's the issue. Why even stand an election if you don't intend to honour the outcome of it at the end? And they could always just say we're getting into opposition, you know, that's happened before, you know, and, and that's been the case. The SDLP went into opposition at one stage. They could just go into opposition if they're refusing to sit with Sinn Féin and allow an executive to be formed in their absence. I don't think they're going to do that. And you sort of the... the the, the mood that I'm hearing from within unionism is that there are no rush to get back into the executive. But that all depends, I think, on what happens in this election. If they get a massive bloody nose, you know, that might change their thinking in terms of the strategy and what strategy they've taken. Jeff but at this point in time, it's not looking in any way like Geoffrey Donaldson is prepared to sit as a, a deputy first minister. So come, come on, Geoffrey. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, we, we, we see you, we hear you in this country. Most days of the week, why on earth would you not be clear with the people of this country who may or may not vote for you? Why would you not do that? Do you want votes on the based on the oh, maybe maybe? Is that what you're about? Is that why you got into politics, Doug Beatty? Is that why you got in? People don't quite know what they're voting for. Oh, you might, you might not. Is that what you're about? My goodness, there's been some harsh questions asked of of Sinn Féin from the Nolan shows over the years. Very harsh questions. Are you seriously telling me if that party stands in front of the electorate and wins the majority of the vote in Northern Ireland to the extent where the people of this country give them the First Minister po post, you lot are going to say never? Really? Is it like some type of bookie that doesn't pay out if people win? Just that little silence. See that silence? Is that what you two are in politics for? Put them up again. So if you want to pick up the phone to this programme tonight, 030 30 80 55 55. My job is to get you a lot of answers. That's my job. Geordie in Monkstown. Hello, Geordie. Hello, Stephen. How's it going, Matt? Have you confidence in this election? Have you confidence that politics can work for you? No. Not whatsoever. Why? Why? Because they're in it for themselves, Stephen. There are so many homeless people here. There are so many people who are starving here. There are so many frontline workers who need pay raises and who need medals, and yet they do nothing for the people. That's not and true. No, this is too uh, easy to say they do nothing. They do a lot. No, they don't, Stephen. Yeah, they, yeah, they do. I've, I've seen them. Yes, they oh, do. Come on, Stephen, seriously. They help the people thing... day in, day out with all kinds of things across their constituency offices. Yes, they do. Do the, well, then, why is there so many homeless? Why is there so many hard, hungry people? Why is the schools not getting free meals? The only time you see them, Stephen, is when they're looking for your vote and the DUP is holding Northern Ireland to ransom. Vote for us or else. DUP will not sit under Sinn Féin and everybody... You don't know that. that. They won't tell you. That, Stephen, the people know it. The people know it. Paul? Mm -hmm. Ian, it's, it's frustrating. Our politics here is divisive. It doesn't work. We need to take it forward. And again, we have an opportunity. There's so much negativity at the minute, but the, the, the positive we can take from it is that there's a chance for change. People can change the makeup of this place and we can move forward and potentially bring people in who will get the work for people and have a government that does work for people. And that's, that's, that's ahead of us. And there's well, a potential of that. Maybe it's about changing the system of government. Maybe. Would you support a new system where parties who want to work together can? Again, we need a collective will. We need people pushing together You're in the all direction. Sound bites, not, not, no, be, not at all. But it's, it's, it's real. But it's met you but, 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 You've got but, all no, these no, sound no. bites. The no, but it's is, not about. You, but Stephen, sound yeah, bites. I'm but saying listen, you want about a new system. But I'll, but I'll tell you. But I'll tell you what I see. I'll tell you what I see. No, no, no. It's not that. I'll tell you what I see. What I see in the ground is as people being failed, and we we need to fix that. So it should be a new system where no political party can pull down an executive. Yes, again, it, it's, our politics is divisive, it's broken, we need to fix it. 
It's as simple as that. So voluntary coalition. No, I, I, again, I think what we have in place now works if people can get to, around a table and work together and push forward. What we have now works now. It, it? Do, it doesn't work, but it can do if people have that will, if they have that sort and of collective don't? will. Well, we, we need to keep working on it. We can't just say, no, that's it, and walk away like others have. Because we're seeing people like John at the top of the programme who's suffering as a result. There's so many out there suffering as a result. But then you're at the mercy of the DUP and Sinn Féin. Like, we, we literally have a situation at the moment where Sinn Féin are criticising the DUP for pulling down the government. Oh, what did Sinn Féin do a few years ago? Pull down the government. But what we have now is an for election... Three years. What we have now is an election coming up and we have people... We put the power in their hands. Vivian and Glenn Gormley. Hello, Vivian. Hi, Stephen. How are you feeling watching this programme tonight? Um, as usual, totally got it. Totally got it in many respects. Tell me why. I'll tell you why, mate. I just watched that, um, your first snippet John. on your phone tonight. John. John was the man. And, yeah, and totally, totally distraught. And I'll tell you why, right? We need to get orange and green out of Northern Ireland, of their politics, of their pre-election scenarios, and do something for the people. Give us some real leadership. Yeah? Jim, Jim, let, me, let me ask Jim Wells. Jim Wells, uh, do you think uh, there is real leadership across... Politics no, in Northern not. Ireland? I can answer you for Jim Wells. No, there isn't. <laughs> Jim, Jim, why don't you answer for yourself? Yeah, no, there, there is, Stephen, because at the end of the day, the long-term benefit of the union is absolutely crucial. And it's only Sorry, the protection that of the that union. that wasn't my comment. I'm not talking about the union or in Oil Ireland. I'm talking about the people that you represent. Answer that one, Jim. And I'm, I'm confident the people that I have represented in South Down see the union as the important issue because the union protects the quality of life of all of the citizens of Northern Ireland economically uh, and without the support of London as we've even seen today uh, and the Chancellor's statement, Northern Ireland could not maintain the standard of living we have at the moment. You're, you're talking about the union and what Vivian's talking about, of course, are, are people whether it's part of a union or not, individual hardship, individual desperation. Alison, could Northern Ireland politics ever be in a place where the individuals matter? Should it be in a place where the individuals matter rather than the top-line aspiration of United Ireland or protecting the union? Look, the, the union is safe until such a point as there is a border poll and the majority of the people in this place decide that they want to live in alternative arrangements. Until that happens, the union is safe. It's not. There's no immediate peril that justifies putting people's, you know, life and livelihoods at risk in preparation for that. But but I think that what it it should do is I think that if you know if I was a unionist and wanted to preserve the union I'd be trying to make this place as best and as comfortable a place to live for everyone and that would be what would preserve the union well into the future rather than what's happening now which I believe is just accelerating the end of the union because if you make well, this place so unworkable and so economically unworkable and so uncomfortable for people to live I mean is that how unionism are trying to preserve so, the union? Sam McBride what are the big questions we need to get answered on behalf of the public ahead of this vote in May. What are they? Well, at the, at the risk of sounding like a politician and not answering your question, Stephen, I think that is, that is for the public. And I think that there, there is a perspective that we need to have on this conversation. People could be very depressed, I think, listening to some of this tonight, listening to John's plight, listening to the, the brokenness of our politics and the problems in even getting a government. And yet we have democracy. We have this very precious thing. We get to decide, each of us as individuals, what we care about when we go to vote. My vote is worth as much as yours or as much as the first ministers or the finance ministers. And that we is We don't have an executive. We don't have an executive, but we get to decide. We can kick every MLA out of, out of office And then if what do we, we get? What, what's the alternative? Has anybody seen... We, the Nolan shows a question in to the NIO, a serious question. Well, our government has fallen. How many times 
has the Secretary of State, Brandon Lewis, been here since the government fell? Has anybody seen this man? A special edition, Nolan Show, Pink Flamingo. Have anybody seen this man give key speeches in Northern Ireland since our government fell? Have you seen him, Sam? I think I've seen him. I, I, I have seen him once since um, that happened, but I'm, I, I, I imagine that wasn't the only time that he was here. Um, but I, th I think it is important, Stephen, that people realise they have incredible power here. They get the leaders and the politicians that they choose. And if those politicians displease them, that is something that they can do something about. They are not powerless here. OK. Let me um, give the final uh, word to Grace. I can give you 30 seconds, Grace, very quickly for me. I just personally think that the older generation of politicians need to go out and the younger ones that don't have the bitterness or were brought up with bitterness need to come in. Well, you've, well, if that's what you think, by the way, older politicians, a lot of experience there, a lot of hinterland, and I'm not sure whether people should be voting for people based on age. Surely they should be voting for people, no offence, Owen, based on what you stand for, what you say, and not just because he's uh, whatever age you are, in your 20s. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. Next, he's one of the UK's most successful comedy writers behind massive hits like Father Ted and the It Crowd. But Graham Lenehan says he's been cancelled because of his controversial views on sex and gender issues. Graham believes if you are born a man, you cannot just get up one day and call yourself a woman. But these days, some people think that is a highly controversial thing to say. In a rare TV interview, rare, because he says no one will speak to him now. Graham talks about how his life has been destroyed. He says he's lost everything, his marriage, his plans for a Father Ted musical, everything. I asked him why he felt the debate has become so, so toxic. Well, you know, there's no, there's no conspiracy here. It, what, what we have here is a kind of a, a naturally arising movement um, that unfortunately is just completely toxic. Um, it's a combination of people who, you know, young teenagers who are confused, who are unhappy and are looking for answers, but also, unfortunately, a huge army of trolls and misogynists and men's rights activists and incels and predators and all sorts of different types who have glommed on to trans rights um, because it gives them a cover for them to do uh, other things. And you know? just, just, just to be clear with the audience, Graham, what this is about, this whole central debate, is about whether... What you are born defines what you are, whether you're male or female, or that you cannot be defined by what's between your legs. The kind of luxury beliefs that people hold at the moment, that you can change sex, that, that um, if you change your pronouns, or if you even say, I am trans, then that actually automatically does something to your... Uh, well, I'm not sure what the argument is. It seems to be that there's a kind of gendered soul that lives within all of us, and, and uh, sometimes it matches up with our body and sometimes it doesn't. I don't believe in souls. I, d I don't believe in gender. Um, I believe we are either male or female. It's, it's also yeah. extremely important if you are someone who genuinely feels that you are born in the wrong body. It's also extremely important if you've considered that throughout your life, you've got counselling, you, 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 in a thoughtful way, want to be your own person in this world, and you don't want to be told by someone else that you have no right to describe yourself as a male, a female. Who cares? As long as you're happy. Why does this hurt you? Because it hurts women. If you, if, if, if you have a, if you find you're in a position where your elderly grandmother, say, is going into a home and you are not allowed to ask for a female carer, that hurts women. But if there was someone through their own lived experience, they were born a male, but they would prefer to be addressed as a woman, would you not want to do that in order for them to feel comfortable in this world? Would you not want to be respectful? Well, yeah, and I am in private. But at the moment, unfortunately, the politicisation of this issue means that I cannot really observe pronouns and things like that while this is going on. This is a war on women. Like, I, I don't, I, the, for me, absolutely, I think that, that um, 
people who are uncomfortable in this body in their bodies who have gender dysphoria which we must remember that's what this is supposed to be about people who have gender dysphoria um they absolutely need the best medical help we can get it's a terribly debilitating thing to have but what is being proposed not not by trans people but by trans activists which are a very different group is that we respect every single person who says, and literally just says, I am trans. And for me, at the moment, the most important consideration, there's two really. One is the safety of, of children, and one is the erosion of women's rights. And women's rights are being devastated at the moment by this. You only have to look at Leah Thomas on the women's swim team, who, who if, if, if Leah Thomas stands in front of one of, one of his um, competitors or one of his, uh, uh, the players on his team, you can't see them. He's so big. His shoulders spread around them. So you cannot see these people there. He's a huge man. He, he wins his races by about 40 seconds. The other women in the race are racing for second place. What kind of a lesson is that to give to young girls? I don't understand why more people aren't up in arms about this. Gender and identity is a woman, Graham. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's a man with long hair, Stephen. You know that you've seen pictures of him. It's a man with long hair. I don't understand why we're all pretending not to know this. So tell me, tell me your story. What has happened to you with Father Ted the Musical? Well, my original bet was that the Ted Musical was too big to fail. I simply thought, if they come after it, then that will be good because then people will see how crazy this is, how, how absurd and how censorious, how anti-female, how, how homophobic that this, that this, or this movement is. Um, so I kind of thought it'll be, it would be okay. But, you know, the more time passed, I was, I was standing up. I was, I was trying to explain myself as clearly as possible. When they couldn't come for me, they came for my wife. They released my wife's address online. They um, sent the police to my home. You know, the police have been to my house uh, several times. I've, I, I, there's, I'm living in a flat now because eventually the pressure of all this drove my wife and I, and I apart, and we divorced. Um, because of this? Yes, yes. And in terms of Father Ted the Musical, had you got that to a stage, Graham, where the industry was interested in it and were backing oh, it and then pulled out? Or what stage yeah. did you get that to? We, we, we've done full rehearsals of it twice. Steve, uh, uh, Neil Hannon has written some of, the most, some of the best music you'll ever hear. We have saw, we have... We have songs for every character. We have a great story. It was ready to go. And just because a group of people uh, have decided that, that anyone who speaks up against this ideology is evil, they've just kind of rolled over for those people. They've, no one is standing up for me. How much does it and hurt? Well, you know, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm used to it. After five years, not one of my friends spoke up. Not one of my friends said in, this, in the showbiz, where I, I often joke, I used to know no one except people in show business. And now I know no one in show business and loads of people outside of it, you know? So I know social work, as I say, I know people from all walks of life, but the, my celebrity friends, comedians, you know, intellectuals who have every, who have an opinion on everything else under the sun, except this subject, they just said to stay silent. And all it needs, all it needs is just a few adults to step into the room and say, hang on a second, He's not saying anything particularly controversial. Why is he so? Why is he so toxic? You say you're going to, you know, you've decided to fight this, but it must feel like a lonely place, and it must hurt, and it must mess you up. Yeah, yeah. You know, they took everything from me. You know, like what? What do you mean? They took my, they took my, my family. You know. You know, before this, I, all I was doing was, you know, writing comedy and playing board, board games and, and, set, and being silly on the internet. And then I just said, no, hang on a sec. Stop calling these women TERFs. Stop sending them abuse. Let them speak. And for that, they, they just destroyed me. Do you honestly feel destroyed? No, because, because the one thing about this, the one thing about this that keeps me going is that I know I'm right, you know? I know I'm right. I, 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 see, I see things, when you open up a newspaper and you see the words, 
uh, used, as I have many a time, about sexual offenders who have suddenly decided they're women. And the word her penis comes up. But every time I see something like that, I just think, well, I'm right and everyone else is wrong. I mean, it's a very strange position for me to be in. It's the opposite position to, to the one I've been in for my, for the rest, for my whole life. And but in this particular case, I gotta say, sex is important, women are real, women's language is important, women need words like women to describe themselves. These are all just basic things. Can I, can I ask a, a, a personal question? Um, you, you say that this, this destroyed your relationship with, with your wife. H how did you two not bond together? How did this not keep you close if someone was attacking you and you love each other? Uh, I don't want to go too much into that because that's like, all I'll say is that it's very frightening when people start coming after you when people start digging up stuff about you and like, I'll, 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 I'll tell you, let me, can I ask that a different way? I'll tell you why other comedians won't stand up for me, even if they agree with me. Um, every comedian at the moment is living under a kind of state of permanent blackmail. Every comedian knows that if they step on the wrong side of any particular line, uh, it could be this, or it could be any other number of things. There's, there's a few hot button issues where you have to follow a certain line. And if you don't, you'll be destroyed. I mean, you know, I've been I've been thoroughly cancelled, Stephen, you know, I'll tell you how cancelled I am. There were two programmes called Cancelled and I wasn't on either of them. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? That's how cancelled I am. We I do believe, Stephen, we will look back at this time and we will go, how did we get so insane? You know, like how did the whole world believe that J.K. Rowling was a bigot despite no evidence being presented to that end? You know, and, and I think and, and I genuinely think and I've, I've said this before, um, but I genuinely think that this is the first serious mass delusion spread by the Internet. I think it's, it's spread by the Internet. Kids spread it to each other. You may have heard the phrase rapid onset gender dysphoria. But you know is, how insulting what you've said will be to some trans people. You know that. Which, which, which that I've said. Mass delusion. It's real for them. No. No, no, well, no, hold on a second. I'm not saying that about trans people. I'm saying that about society as a whole. For me, as I say, I know a lot of trans people who are just as shocked by this stuff, and they're terrified that there's going to be a backlash against trans people. Come to the end of this interview, I'm desperate to ask you why you feel really that this is worth it. If you rationally look at what you are giving away to fight for this cause, you're giving away your career, your relationship's gone, your financial stability is gone, your friends, you say, are gone. How on earth is this worth it? <laughs> because, because sometimes something is so wrong that you have to say something. And if, 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 I, if I didn't say something, I, I'd go mad. And do you know of your friends, your lifelong friends standing by you? Well, no, I mean, you know, look, I, the thing is you can't ring round people and ask them to be brave. You know, I, I did do a version of that where I rang up a bunch of people and I said to them, look, would you sign? We had a letter um, supporting J.K. Rowling in the face of death and rape threats. And we said, would you, I, you know, I rang up various people I knew. I took, I thought, I thought surely this will rouse them, you know. Uh, and I, I rang all these people and every single one of them said no, you know. And all it would take would be a few people with courage to stand up and say, hang on a sec. We need to talk about this without people losing their livelihoods. We need to be able to discuss this in a in a in a in an adult way. You're telling me you, they wouldn't sign a letter to say death and rape threats were wrong. Yeah, yeah. That is extraordinary, Graham. I know. The, the, like one of the other things about this whole thing is that it is a failure of you know intellectuals of of of. You know, I mean, I actually class comedians pretty highly because I think comedians think about stuff in interesting ways. But it's a failure of comedy. It's a failure of, of, of journalism because journalists are, are openly hiding the truth. What I can share from, from my experience of, of, of making a 10 part podcast on this, along with, with, with David Thompson um, mm -hmm. from the Nolan team, is that there was very much a, a division of opinion, but there were people within the BBC, within the organization I work for, an organization where the whole meaning of it at its core is to speak up, to speak out, 
And there were quite significant senior people within the BBC contacted me confidentially, frightened to speak up about this subject, frightened yeah. to express an opinion. The vast yeah, majority of them, female journalists. Fright, yes. Frightened to even speak about it. Yes, that's I, and and isn't it isn't it relevant that it's women uh, female journalists who are frightened to speak because the the punishment like the punishment meted out to me has been pretty you know pretty bad but the punishment meted out to women is much much worse. Every one of us who speaks up is left hanging in the wind by everyone else. We Grim, need more people. My final question to you, and this is the final question: Why are you speaking to me about this? You've said this is one of the the first times you've spoken out. Why now? No one asks me, Steve. Like, like I've never well, been. Thanks asked. very much. <laughs> no, but uh, like I've never been asked to to share my opinion. Basically, again, because I've been cast as a evil um, influence or whatever you whatever people call me, um, other people are not allowed to speak to me. So I don't go. I'm never on podcasts. I'm never on anything because those people know that they will be uh, targeted if they speak to me. Wow. So uh, the Nolan show is targeted quite often. Um, and, <laughs> yeah. And we don't uh, we don't ban anybody, and we seek to to give everybody a platform. Um, and it's been a pleasure. Even speak, people like me. <laughs> well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, Graham. And, Thanks, and I, I hope those who disagree with you have their voice heard. But I hope you equally have have your voice heard, Graham. And hopefully, I've done. A bit of that tonight with you. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Really appreciate it. Listen, that's about it from us for tonight. Before I go, you are going to hear a lot about the election over coming weeks. We all know how important democracy is in Northern Ireland because the alternative is scary. Value your vote. And I hope through the Nolan Radio Show over the next few weeks to give as many of you a voice as possible so that you choose wisely. We'll be back for Nolan at 9 tomorrow morning. So sleep well, and we'll see you in just a few hours' time. Night-night. <laughs>